President of the University, Wachan Han Kaoshing. I'm very happy to join the world famous Tsinghua University. What do you think about Chinese? Is this okay for me to speak in Chinese? You are a world class institution. You are a symbol of success of China's education sector. You are the foundation for China's economic miracle. You have produced great leaders, including President Xi. It is not surprising that China's economic growth and its new leadership in research science and technology have taken a place together. I particularly like the old Chinese saying, if you think in terms of year, plant a seed. If you think in terms of 10 years, plant a tree. But if you in terms of 100 years, then teach the people. In India, to the ancient saying is, Vaye krute vardhate eva nityam vidya dhanam sarvadhan pradhanam. The wealth that increases by giving, that wealth is knowledge and is supreme of all possessions. This is one example of our, how our two nations are united in their timeless wisdom. There is much more, though 
that links our two ancient civilizations. I began my journey in China, in Xi'an. In doing so, retraced the footsteps of the Chinese monk, Henstang. He traveled to India from Xi'an in the seventh century in search of knowledge and returned to Xi'an as a friend and chronicler of India. President Xi's visit in India last September started from Ahmedabad. It is not far from Vadnagar, my birthplace, but important because it hosted Huensang and many pilgrims from China. The world's first large-scale educational exchange program took place between India and China during the Thang dynasty. Records talk of about 80 Indian monks coming to China and nearly 150 Chinese monks returning after their education in India. And yes, this was in the 10th and 11th century. Mumbai's rise as a port and a shipbuilding center each because of cotton trade with China. And those who love silk and textile know, know that India's famous Tanchoi Saris owe themselves to three brothers from my state of Gujarat who learned the art of weaving from Chinese masters in the 19th century. And in an unquestionable evidence of our ancient trade, silk in our classical Sanskrit language is called Shinapatta. So, the centuries-old story of our relations had been of spiritualism, learning, art and trade. It is a picture of respect for each other's civilization and of shared prosperity. It is reflected in the human values of Dr. Dwarkanath Kotnis, a doctor from India who treated soldiers in China during the Second World War. Today, after difficult and sometimes dark passages of history, India and China stand at a rare moment of vast multiple transition in the world. Perhaps the most significant change of this era is the re-emergence of China and India. The world's two most populous nations are undergoing economic and social transformation on a scale and at a speed that is unmatched in history. China's success over the past three decades has changed the character of the global economy. India is now the next frontier of the economic revolution. We have the demography for it. About 800 million people in India are below the age of 35 years. Their aspirations, energy, enterprise and skills will be the force for India's economic transformation. We know and we now have the political mandate and the will to make it happen. Over the past year, we have moved with a clear and coherent vision. And we have acted with speed, resolve and boldness to implement it. We have taken sweeping steps 
to reform our policies and open up more to foreign direct investments. This includes new areas like insurance, construction, defense, and railways. We are eliminating unnecessary regulations and simplifying our procedures. We are using digital technology to eliminate multiple approvals and endless wait. We are building a tax regime that is predictable, stable, and competitive, and that will integrate the Indian market. We are scaling up investment in next generation infrastructure, roads, ports, railways, airport, telecom, digital network, and clean energy. Our resources are being allocated with speed and transparency, and we will make sure that land acquisition does not become a barrier to growth or a burden on farmers. We are creating the global skill pool to establish a modern economy with a world-class manufacturing sector. We are reviving our agriculture sector to restore the fortunes of our farmers and boost our growth. Like China, urban renewal is both a necessity and a means to add energy to our economy. We are combining traditional strategies with modern economic instruments to eliminate poverty and create security for the poor. We have launched a major schemes on financial inclusion of all providing funds to the Sun Bank, to the Unbank, and ensuring efficient and direct transfer of benefit to the poor. And we are ensuring that insurance and pension schemes reach the poorest. We have set time-bound goals for providing access to housing, water, and sanitation to all. This would not just transform lives, but also generate a new source of economic momentum. Above all, we are changing the way we govern ourselves, not just in the way we work in New Delhi, but also in the way we work together with state governments, districts, and cities. Because we know, as you do, that our vision may be formed in Delhi, but our success will be determined by state capitals. That is why I am here today with two chief ministers, which is a new aspect of our foreign policy. And for the first time for India, Premier Lee and I had met with provincial leaders and chief minister to discuss our partnership. I know that rewriting policies can be easier than changing mindsets and work culture. But we are on the right path. You will feel the change in India. And you can see it in our growth rate. It has now increased to 7.5% and we are encouraged by international experts speak in one voice of higher growth rates. In many ways, our two countries reflect the same aspirations, similar challenges, and the same opportunities. We can be inspired by each other's successes. And in the global uncertainties of our times, we can reinforce each other's progress. Perhaps no other economy in the world offer such opportunities for the future as India's. And few partnerships are as filled with promise and awards. During President Xi's visit last September, 
we set for ourselves a new level of ambition for our cooperation. Partnership in modernizing Indian railways, two Chinese industrial parts in India, commitments of $20 billion in investments into India, our the next five years partnership in our Make in India mission, that is the shape of our future. Tomorrow in Shanghai, we will see the agreements on first of those partnership between our industries. But to maintain this partnership over the long run, we must also improve the exchange of Indian industry to the Chinese market. I am encouraged by President Xi's and Premier Li's commitment to resolve this problem. As much as our bilateral cooperation, our international partnership will be important for each other's success. Our changing world has created new opportunities and challenges. We both face instability in our shared neighborhood that can threaten our security and slow down our economies. The spreading tide of extremism and terrorism is a threat we both face for both its source is in the same region. We must also deal with the changing character of terrorism that has made it less predictable and more diffuse. We source a large part of our energy from the same region that faces instability and uncertainty future. India and China conduct their international commerce on the same sea lanes. The security of sea lanes is vital for our two economies and our cooperation is essential to achieve it. Equally, we both seek to connect a fragmented Asia. There are projects we will pursue individually. There are few such as the Bangladesh, China, India, Myanmar corridor that we are doing jointly. But geography and history tell us that the dream of an interconnected Asia will be successful when India and China work together. We are two countries that have gained a lot from an open, rule-based, global trading system. Equally, we have most to lose if it breaks down. We both have enormous stakes in the international negotiations on climate change. Our cooperation in these reforms we will be crucial to shape their outcomes. Today, we speak of Asia's resurgence. It is the result of the rise of many powers in the region at the same time. It is an Asia of great promise, but also many uncertainties. Asia's reemergence is leading to a multipolar world that we both welcome. But it is also an unpredictable and complex environment of shifting equations. We can be more certain of a peaceful and stable future for Asia if India and China cooperate closely. A resurgent Asia is seeking a bigger voice in global affairs. India and China seek a greater role in the world. It may be reforms in the United Nations Security Council or the new Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. But Asia's voice will be stronger and our nation's role more influential if India and China speak in one voice for all of us and for each other. Simply put the prospects of the 21st century becoming 
the asian century will depend in large measures of what india and china achieve individually and what we do together <laughs> the rising fortunes of 2.5 billion pairs of joint hands will be of the greatest consequences of our region and the humanity this is the vision that i share with president xi and premier li try to settle the boundary question quickly we both recognize that this is history legacy resolving it is our shared responsibility to the future we must move ahead with new purpose and determination the solution we choose should do more than settle the boundary question it should do so in a manner that transforms our relationship and not cause new disruptions we have been remarkable remarkably successful in maintaining peace and tranquility along the border we must continue to do that on the principle of mutual and equal security our agreements protocols and border mechanisms have been helpful but a shadow of uncertainty always hangs over the sensitive areas of border region it is because neither side knows where the line of actual control is in this area that is why i have proposed resume the process of clarifying it we can do this without prejudice to our position on the boundary question we should think of creative solution to issues that have become irritants from visa policies to trans border rivers sometimes small steps can have a deep impact on how our people see each other we are both increasing our engagement in our shared neighborhood this calls for deeper strategic communication to build mutual trust and confidence we must ensure that our relationship with other countries do not become a source of concern for each other and wherever possible and feasible we should work together as we did in responding to the earthquake in nepal if the last century was the age of alliance this is an era of interdependence so talks of alliances against one another have no foundation in any case we are both ancient civilizations large and independent nations neither of us can be contained or become part of anyone's plans so our partnership in international forum should not be determined by the concerns of others but the interests of our two countries china's support for india's permanent membership of a reform un security council and for india's membership of export control regime like nuclear supplies group will do more than just strengthen 
our international cooperation. It will take our relationship to a new level. It will give Asia a stronger voice in the world. If we are able to deepen mutual trust and confidence, we will also be able to reinforce each other's efforts of connecting Asia with itself and the rest of the world. Our soldiers face each other on the border, but we should also deepen our defense and security cooperation to address our many common challenges. Above all, as we look ahead, we must build more bridges of familiarity and comfort between our people. About 33% of the world's population is either Indian or Chinese. Yet, our people know very little of each other. We must seek inspiration from the pilgrims of the ancient times who braved the unknown in search of knowledge and enrich us both. So we have decided to extend electronic tourist visa to Chinese nationals. We are also <laughs> we are celebrating the year of India in China in 2015. We are launching the provincial and state leaders forum today. Later today, we will have the Tai Chi and Yoga event. It will represent the coming together of our two civilizations. We are starting the Gandhi and India Study Center in Fudan University and a college of yoga in Kunming. The second route to Kailash Mansarovar for Indian pilgrims will start in June, for which I want to thank President Xi. These are just some of the many steps India and China are taking to bring the world's two largest populations in closer contact. For this reason, I choose to speak today at a university because it is the youth that will inherit the future of our countries and the responsibility of our relationship. President Xi has spoken eloquently about the interconnected dreams of China and India and the new type of relationship between major countries. Not only are our dreams interconnected, our future is also deeply interconnected. We are at a moment when we have the opportunity to make our choices. India and China are two proud civilizations and two great nations that will fulfill their destinies. We each have the strength and the will to choose our own paths to success. But we have the ancient wisdom to know that our journey will be smoother and our future brighter when we, we will walk together confident of one another and in step with each other. Thank you very much and thanks for your invitation. Thanks a lot. Prime Minister Modi for your wonderful speech. Now the floor is open for questions. Any questions on the floor? Yes, please. Your I'm Gao Cheng, a graduate student from the Department of Thermal Engineering. Well, in the age of globalization, uh, regional cooperation plays a pivotal role in one nation's development. Uh, being neighbors, China and India both have the great economic potentials. So what do you think about the idea of expanding uh, China-India bilateral cooperation into a regional cooperation? And uh, what regional architecture for economic cooperation would the Indian suggest to Chinese leaders? Thank you.
पैसे मेरे भाषण में मैंने विस्तार से इस बात का उल्लेख किया है आज वर्ल्ड ऑर्डर पूरी तरह बदल चुका है और जब वर्ल्ड ऑर्डर पूरी तरह बदल चुका है तब और सारी दुनिया जब कहती है कि 21वीं सदी एशिया की सदी है तब एशिया में रहने वाले हम लोगों का दायित्व सविशेष बढ़ जाता है और उसमें भी चीन और भारत का दायित्व और बढ़ जाता है भारत ने और चीन ने आर्थिक विकास की दिशा में कई पहल करनी होगी चीन के पास तीन चीजों में विशेषताएं हैं स्केल स्किल एंड स्पीड वो हर चीज बहुत विशाल रूप से करते हैं और बहुत तेज गति से करते हैं भारत भी उसी तेज गति से आगे बढ़ना चाहता है तो ऐसे कई क्षेत्र हैं कि जिसमें हम मिलकर के काम कर सकते हैं चाइना ने 30 साल पहले अर्बनाइजेशन को एक अपॉर्चुनिटी माना और उसने अर्बन इंफ्रास्ट्रक्चर अर्बन क्वालिटी ऑफ लाइफ अर्बन को इकोनॉमी का ग्रोथ सेंटर और उसका परिणाम चाइना को मिला आज भारत भी स्मार्ट सिटी का कंसेप्ट लेकर के आगे बढ़ रहा है तो मैं समझता हूं कि हम लोगों के लिए ये आवश्यक है कि हम दोनों देश एक दूसरे के साथ जैसे आईटी भारत चाइना के लिए बहुत कुछ कर सकता है टूरिज्म भारत और चाइना के बीच बहुत बढ़ सकता है टेक्नोलॉजी के क्षेत्र में हम बहुत आदान प्रदान कर सकते हैं और इसलिए मैंने मेरे भाषण में भी विस्तार से कहा है कि आर्थिक संबंधों और समझौतों को लेकर के हमें आगे बढ़ना है During my speech, I mentioned that the world order is changing dramatically. In this century, it is Asia century. In this century, India and China are very important nations. The bilateral relationship of India is on the rising path. I said a lot that uh, China has three advantages. For example, scale, skill, etc., etc. And India would like to uh, speed up the development. We have a lot of area to cooperate with. For example, in in China, uh, urbanization is one of the advantage. Currently, in India, we also launched a campaign of what we call smart city campaign. What we need to do is that the both countries need to cooperate and spare efforts in the following area. For example, in the IT area, India has a lot of advantage in this in this part, and India is stand ready to help China. In the technology area, we can also have cooperation. Now, we move to the next question, please. I'd like to give this chance to a lady, please. Thanks, Thanks, Mr. President, for giving me the chances. And I'm Li Linye, an undergraduate from the Department of Foreign Languages and Literature. Your Excellency Prime Minister, I think we all feel the inspiring future from your lecture. And I read you another statement that 21st century would be India century because of its democracy, population bonus, and market demand. Actually, the three elements have been there for several decades, and Indian's economic growth has varied in different periods. So could you please elaborate on how democracy, population bonus, and market demand contribute to the current Indian economy? Thank you very much. Thank you.
मैं हमेशा कहता हूं कि सवा सौ करोड़ का देश वो अपने आप में एक बहुत बड़ा परचेजिंग पावर भी है एट द सेम टाइम जिस देश said a lot that uh, India has 3D advantages, for example, democracy, uh, demographic dividend, etc., etc. India has 1.2 uh, billion people. Over 800 million, uh, below, say, 35 years old. This is a very good advantage. And democracy is also a key advantage to us. We can establish contact with the rest of the world. I believe those advantages may contribute a lot to our future development. For example, infrastructure. For, uh, for example, manufacturing. By 2020, uh, according to the estimation that. Uh, Many countries in the area of uh, technology they might doing very good. Some are good in the uh, infrastructure, etc., etc. But it seems that there are lack of uh, labor force. But India may supply the world demand. In the meantime, I believe in manufacturing area, young people may play a vital role in this part. This demographic dividend may, may not only con uh, conducive to India's development, but also serve as a good opportunity for the rest of the international community. In the, in the, in the world, we know the market demand is on the rising path. We are currently doing something to improve the skill and comprehensive capability of our, of our young people. And uh, in the part of uh, uh, democracy, I think many countries have spared effort in this regard. Thank you. 